Hey, what's up, my Woods people? I'm Tyler Jones, and this is the Backcountry Mini Series from the Element Podcast. Casey, fill them in. Since we are diving headfirst into the backcountry hunting this season, we decided to call in some help and talk to some experts that know how to crush it in the backcountry. So make sure and subscribe, and if this is helpful, we'd love for you guys to give us a five-star rating and an iTunes review. Absolutely. Now let's get into it, because I still have a lot of Mountain House flavors to try before September gets here. <laughs> All right, on the show today, we've got Aaron Snyder with Kafara International. Aaron, what's going on, dude? Not too much. Well, that's a lie. A lot is going on, actually. <laughs> it's Monday morning. Um, I was in Oregon all weekend doing a seminar on uh, backpack hunting, so I'm, I'm getting caught up. Now. Oh, well, it sounds like you're appropriate to have on the show, then, if you just did a <laughs> seminar on what we're going to talk about, so that's good. Is that something that you do just out of the goodness of your heart, or is it a good opportunity to go home, and, or what were you doing, man? I generally try to not ever do them because I'm not very good at uh, <laughs> social environments with a lot of people. But, um, no, Botech is a, a dealer for us now. And uh, I'm from Oregon, so I was able to go home and uh, see my mom, so that was good. But, um, I mean, I don't mind doing seminars when I have time. Right now it's super busy. Um, but it was good. I did it with Phelps, with Phelps Game Calls. And, uh, yeah, he's longtime friend, so it was a good deal. Yeah, cool. Well, that sounds like fun, I guess. uh a lot of people learned a lot of stuff. Those are y'all are two dudes that do a lot of elk hunting, and uh, that's what we uh, try to do. But we're kind of far from from the mountains. We get out there as often as we can. So, but I do kind of like uh, the Aaron Snyder story. You know, I, I learned about you from a from a different podcast, and uh, and then when y'all started the Kafaro Cast, I was kind of excited uh, just because I got to you know it's a little bit more of you get to kind of have a little bit more insight as to who you are and what you really do and stuff. And uh, so can you tell the audience a little bit about, you know, kind of how you grew up and uh, kind of come from that blue collar side of things? Yeah, yeah. I grew up in uh, a town of about 180 people in Oregon, right in the Cascade Mountain Range. It's a logging community. And uh, I think uh, my dad made a whopping $1,400 a month for a family of, of four. So, there was a lot of uh, mushroom picking and weed whacking <laughs> before school clothes and shit like that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I joined the Army when I was um, 17 or 18 young. And then uh, I was in the Army for a few years and then got out and worked um, construction, um, commercial glass and ironworking, uh, more commercial glass, basically high rises and curtain walls, things like that. And then, uh, you know, what? in the middle of that, I started doing a lot of you know, I was always in the field a lot or in the wilderness, so I started doing a lot of gear testing and, and found out a lot of, um, well, a lot of companies lie, basically. There's a lot of sales pitches and gimmicks, and there's just certain things that do work and that don't. And so I started kind of relaying what I was finding out on uh, forums and things like that. And somewhere in the middle there, I, I tested out a Kafaru pack and, and met Patrick, the owner, and... Uh, with a lot of twists and turns uh, down the side now, several years down the road, I'm, I'm the president of the company. So um, did that by living in the woods too much with barely graduating high school. So uh, there is hope for some of you out there. <laughs> man, what an American I mean, story. <laughs> right? Yeah. No, that's cool, man. That's good. I, I come from a construction background. That's still how I make my living, you know, is uh, – I uh, do a lot of remodeling, build some houses along the way and stuff. So uh, I, I don't know. I think it uh, getting out and, uh, you know, busting your, your thumb a few times with a hammer really can kind of teach you a few things. Uh, what do you think that you kind of learned from, from that background that kind of helps you more in that business world today? Just hard work, really. I mean, um, I hate to say the cliche, you know, or whatever, but I mean, it's, you know, the harder, the more you put into something, the more you, you know, you get out of it. And, um, I just try to keep going with that, I guess, you know, just try to put as much work in as I can. And, and, uh, you know, my main goal, uh, surprisingly enough is to get the hell out of the industry and go <laughs> hunting and not have to be on social media and just live in the woods and go hunt all the time. So my goal is quite a bit different than a lot of the people you see on social media anymore. Like, I'm trying to not have an Instagram page and uh, <laughs> you know, just go hunting. Yeah. yeah but, uh, 
Yeah, that's a uh, hard that's, work. That's like why uh, your captions are pretty short. <laughs> uh, I, I would assume, right? We're non-existent. <laughs> <laughs> We're non-existent at all. <laughs> it's kind of depressing, actually. Uh, Aaron Snyder puts, uh, I mean, a, a bat of the bone picture up and doesn't put any words and gets like seven thousand likes on it or whatever. You know, <laughs> but that's good. No, that's cool, man. So, um, when do when do you think that you had? I don't know. You might not even be able to recount this because you just have done stuff like this for so long. But like, what was your first like true backcountry experience? Oh, I, actually, with you know, within a few months, um, when I, I was on a, a trail crew team when I was super young, um, in uh, where you you hike all the wilderness trails where I'm where I'm from in, in Detroit Lake, Oregon. It's the kind of by the PCT or the Pacific Crest Trail and all the those wilderness trails in that area we would go in and uh clean off the logs and in branches and whatever for the people hiking and that was really my first big one where we did like a seven day trip you know 10 miles a day um all over the wilderness and that's where it probably started the most right there yeah you know, it's like 14 Wow. Okay, that's carrying great. A, carrying a cross cuts on an axe, little <laughs> back kid. <laughs> Golly, man, that's uh, so that's pretty tough work. So the government would hire fourteen year olds to do that back then. <laughs> uh, well, what it was is there's a youth conservation corps where they hire ah, high school kids to okay. uh, to clean like you know all these outhouses and the state parks. Since the people at the Forest Service knew me and knew I was kind of an outdoorsy kid. Uh, yeah, I was making, to give you an idea, 305 was minimum wage. Um, you know, there was parameters we were supposed to probably follow for me at that age to not be running chainsaws and crosscut saws, but, um, I don't think anybody followed them and it, it made me a, you know, better person for it. it made me learn how to feel pain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. No kidding, dude. Yeah. That's, that's cool. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it means a lot to be able to kind of, have that kind of hard work in your life at such a like important age, you know. I see dudes all the time who like uh, didn't work in high school or whatever and go to college, and then they get thrown out in the world, and they have to go get a job, and it's it's like they don't really know how to just put their nose down and just do something, you know. And I think that it's it's pretty important. Like for me, uh, I was like ten years old, and my first job was. I got paid a penny a nail for every nail I picked up around, you know, job sites or whatever, and might have made like thirty five cents. Some new nails, <laughs> throwing them in my used nail box. <laughs> well, my granddad rigged me up a magnet. My dad was kind of ticked about that. He didn't. It kind of made things a little bit easier than what it was supposed to be. But you know, that's what grandparents are for. They kind of make it easier on you. But no, that's good, man. That's that's cool. And and you know that hard work stuff and just I guess getting after it early really kind of laid the groundwork for you to just uh, kind of belong in the backcountry almost, you know. And uh, how many days a year do you think you spend kind of in the field? Oh, man, I, I got my partner in crime, Frank, here. Frankly, 180, 200? Yeah, we're probably pushing 200 a year. Um, now, this isn't like – I've heard guys say that, and, and they're just driving around in the woods. Like that's nice, right? Like that's <laughs> full on in the in the wilderness or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we're in the woods in one way, shape, form, or fashion, damn near every day. But um, you know, where we're actually backpacking in almost nonstop from August um, through oh November, we're backpack hunting, and definitely the majority of Part of May, June, July, um, we're scouting or backpack fishing. And then, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, throughout the winter, um, we're out there. We may not be camping, but Frank might be predator hunting. You know, I went on you know, some mountain lion hunts. Um, so it, it's a lot, you know, and in, in the middle, I would say, you know, on average, we're dealing with anywhere from 20 to, to 50 animals on the ground, whether it be Frank putting them on the ground, me or someone else, you know, we're, we're dealing with pretty, well, as of late, with the stick bow in in Alabama, that's, which is not wilderness, I would I would say that oh oh we're we're probably shooting I'd say we're killing probably thirty to fifty animals each. So you get a lot of experience behind that, which is cool. Sure. So with that much time out there, man, the the uh, I mean your house, your home, everything you do is on your back, man. And so the pack is like the 
got to be one of the chiefly important things that you guys are are using. Um, what do you what is the, what is the first thing you're looking for in, in a pack? You know, like if you were to give a little advice for somebody who's looking to buy buy a pack and get into the wilderness thing a little bit. I just make sure it fits. Is one you know pack and boots? Those are the big ones. Uh, that's what I suggest because you have both of those on all the time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you get a pack that doesn't fit, you know, I try to oversimplify this. If you have a size 12 foot and you're wearing a size 10 boot, you know, you're probably not going to be happy. So <laughs> get a pack that fits and is fitted for you. Mm -hmm. um, and then get the uh, same thing with boots in a pack. Get the size that's applicable for what you're doing or what will work. You know, some boots will work for – 90% of the stuff, some packs will work for 90% of the stuff, but you don't want to wear, you know, insulated boots on an antelope hunt. You don't want to wear a day pack on a 10 day hunt. Mm -hmm. So you just want to make sure you have uh, the, the right size pack for what's applicable for what you're doing. Yeah. Well, as far as, so as far as like, I mean, you see packs or at least I, I've seen packs that have a ton of pockets and some that uh, are pretty sleek, you know, I mean, what's your, what's your perspective there on that? Oh, man, without getting myself in trouble, and <laughs> Frank and I kind of had the same view. Uh, a lot of pockets are for guys, to me, that are gadget guys that, that aren't. I don't know very many people that backpack on a lot that use a lot of pockets. Okay. They do use some. Of course, they're going to use some. But Frank and I might be towards the other end of the extreme where we're like uh, four pockets at the most type of guys. Like, I need one big bag, and then I need a simple amount of pockets on the outside to hold butt wipe, gloves, beanie hat, headlamp, snacks, and a map. After that, I don't really need those pockets. Those pockets add weight. They add clutter. I just need to hold the primary stuff to keep me, you know, functioning and happy. Um, after that, the main bag to me is kind of like the pickup bed. I need some, I need a glove box. I need some stuff on the inside of the car. But in the back, I just want a big, long bed to haul a lot of sh I don't need a lot of compartmentalization in there. I just need it to haul a lot. Right, right. So uh, when you're, when you're okay, so going to, into like packing the bag a little bit, um, let's just kind of start kind of big, I guess. And, and you know, like we're, we're talking about this. Uh, the, our idea came from this was because Casey drew a Gila tag. So we're you're looking at, you know, the southern end of – the mountain range, the Rocky Mountain Range, essentially, I guess. So, um, you know, a hunt in late September there is going to be, like, packing for that is going to be a little different than packing for late September uh, Idaho or British Columbia or something like that. I mean, what are the main main differences? Obviously, in the Gila, you probably don't have a very high chance of seeing a blizzard in late September, but you might somewhere else, right? It, it's, it's actually not. I think people over overcomplicate it and, and frank and i do get to hunt everywhere so you know what's going to change is maybe one of your layers meaning your puffy might be a little bit thinner than somebody else's um and then your rain jacket you might be able to go with a little bit more spartan rain jacket um shelter wise probably not going to be that much difference you know you won't need gators where you might somewhere else but two or three items is about it yeah. um not that much not that much difference yeah yeah, yeah. So, a while ago, you were talking about, you know, how it's really important to have a pack that fits. Uh, being, we're not really from out east, but, you know, technically, it's probably what you would call us as Easterners. You know, we're northeast Texas. But um, how does a guy understand what pa good pack fit looks like and then, in turn, like, get fitted for a pack when they don't live anywhere near where good packs are sold? Well, I mean, we sell thousands a year, so by just generally ask, well... Let's give an example right now. I, How tall are you? I am 5'11 on a good day. <laughs> What's your pant length? Uh, 32. All right. So your torso length is probably 18 and a half inches. So average. Uh, what's your waistline? 32. All right. So you're skinny. So you got a small belt. The Thanks. curvature of Appreciate your back. That. <laughs> um, no problem. Um, the curvature of your back. Do you have like the standard white man butt where if you don't wear a, a belt, your pants fall down? I'm, I'm substandard at that. So, yes, I, I guarantee you. So you you've got with, with Kefaru, um, we have different bins to the stay to match your back profile, which mm -hmm. we're, we're about the only one. We actually I think we are the only ones that do that. So you would have a flat back profile. So we would match that to you. The shoulder straps would be um, 
probably the short shoulder. Well, they definitely would be our short shoulder straps that matches the curvature to your, your smaller body frame. Um, and then, you know, you don't, uh, necessarily need a super tall frame. Uh, and that has to do with the load lifters on the angle of when you pull on these load lifters, it's not really lifting anything other than the shoulder straps off your shoulders to transfer the weight to your hip bone. So you get away with a 24 inch frame. Um, you could use a 26 as well. And that's where I say pack fit. Is the belt fit right? Are the shoulder straps adjusted correctly? Is the load lifter angle correct? Is the placement of where the load lifter attaches to the shoulder strap correct? All of that just, it's comfort, you know, keeps you in the field longer. And the more you can customize that, which obviously that's what we specialize in, in, you know, pride ourselves in is being able to customize each person as close as we can without being totally custom. I mean, it's pretty close, but... You know, some of it is, uh, you know, obviously the bag's not custom. You're choosing the bag. But the fit was is uh, what we specialize in. Yeah, no, that's cool. So it's kind of, I mean, to condense what you just said, uh, call y'all, and you can pretty much, with your experience, just tell us what we need, and you're going to get pretty close on the first shot. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, usually I'd say, you know, maybe one out of 100 might need some torquing, you know, after you get it, you know, so we, we're pretty pretty dang good, um, you know, getting it. Out, getting getting it done correct out of the gate. Yeah, mm-hmm. I got you. So, um, you know, you're talking about belt fit and stuff like that. Man, I'm one of those guys, like, I just don't have hips at all. And I've heard, you know, that that's, you know, when you really start putting a load on, you're trying to get weight on your hips. Well, I just, I don't understand how you do that. To me, it just seems like it's so much more comfortable to try to put weight on my shoulders because that's where it rests. Is there, is there a way to circumvent that or is that about pack fit and I've never had one that fits correctly? Yeah, you just never had one that fits correctly. I got you. Yeah. Well, all right then. There you go. <laughs> so, well, I mean, you you know, you you think about it. I mean, it's no different than uh, if if I went and grabbed a rifle from from Walmart or uh, something, and I don't know anything about like basically the bolt or as far as when when you engage the bolt to cock uh, around in when you get a custom rifle, they're going to check and see. I, I guess it's Frank. Is that called the stroke? I can't remember the name of it, but uh, basically <laughs> there's going to be a distance for the l- length of your body for um, the butt stock to be. There's yeah. going to be a distance you want that, that rifle scope to be away from your eye. Mm-hmm. Well, if I just grabbed one, I'm like, man, I scope myself all the time or I'm kind of bunched up when I'm um, you know, putting a round in. That's because I bought a generic gun off the, you know, right off the shelf and yeah. threw yeah. a scope on it rather than going to a, a custom gun where it's actually built for my body yeah 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 so let's go into like uh how you how you put your pack together essentially like how uh what are you how do you pack you know a lot of guys i'm sure putting sleeping bag at the bottom but what does that system look like for you well everybody on that system should be the the same but my uh my sleeping bag and pad and uh you know a few twists and turns aside there may be some other lighter weight stuff down there go at the bottom um, above that, I've usually got my shelter and my food. The heaviest part's going to be at the middle of my back. Um, you know, kind of around that, I'm just feeling space, whether it be with a puffy jacket or, oh, my, my camera kit or, you know, kill kit, whatever that's going to go kind of around that. And then on the top, I'm going to have like my stove, um, you know, my, my cook, my, my cook stove could go up there, my possibles pouch or survival kit, my med kit. Um, those things can go kind of around or on top of that. And it's just, what you're trying to get is the bulk of the weight in the middle of your back. That is what's vital. And then obviously common sense, what you need quickly needs to be either on the top of the pack or in the outer pockets. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. So, so you're a stove guy, right? You carry a stove pretty much everywhere. Uh, Oh, sometimes it depends, man. It depends on the water. Um, you know, if if there's no water, there's no reason to bring a stove. So, you know, it, it really depends on the situation. But when I have the option, yeah, I bring a stove. Yeah, yeah, I got you. What? So, uh, are you just mountain house most of the time, or what? What does your food system look like? Nah, I, I never eat mountain house anymore. Um, <laughs> I eat a lot from like off grid. Uh, they make good stuff. I'll make my own a lot. Um, you know, you can buy brown rice, top ramen and put olive oil tuna packets in there, and it's like the poor man's delight. Uh, you can dehydrate <laughs> burger. 
you know, you can make shepherd's pie yourself with Idaho and potatoes and dehydrate everything else. And just a mixture, really, you know, I, I eat a lot of peanut butter. Um, so I may have like a peanut butter, bacon, honey, bagel sandwich, um, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, as one of my snacks during the day. Um, but as far as the dinners, you know, I, I try not to ever eat Mountain House just because there is a high sodium content. It's not very healthy. It's end up be like wiping a marker, right? When you go to the bathroom, it just never comes clean. That's another problem. So yeah. I try to uh, I try to to keep my digestive system the same out there as I as it is back home. Yeah, yeah, Makes yeah. Sense. that's tough. I'm a peanut butter guy too. So, have you ever hiked any of those Black Canyon trails? Black Canyon, no, huh? And Gunnison. Well, we did that. I guess that's like my one and only backcountry experience. We did that a couple years back and went to the Black Canyon to Gunnison and uh, had like an epic trout fishing trip down there. And I carried a whole, like the big tub of peanut butter Five down there with me and never even <laughs> opened it. So, like, that's the kind of amateurs you're dealing with right here. And like, just the <laughs> dudes who just don't make smart choices, right? But yeah, peanut butter is life, man. It's just the way it goes. But, uh, anyways, uh, <clears throat> so. When you're talking, you know, you're talking about your pack earlier about, you know, all the different stuff that fits and sizes and all that stuff. Um, I've noticed that with y'all's packs, you kind of have like a two-part system where there's the frame and then you buy the bag separately. Um, is that for a better fit or is that so that you can kind of interchange different uh, bags that go in the frame and kind of have different things that do different stuff? Uh, multiple different uh reasons actually one is is load hauling a frame pack's going to haul more weight yeah uh two is going to be interchanging the bags i mean when you buy them at the same time obviously we put them together for you but yeah if you want to just run the frame as a load hauler if you want to run a day pack a multi-day back those will all interchange we have a lot of internal frame packs too but for the most part like the the heavy load hauling obviously is the frame system yeah Mm -hmm. um you know when you get something that doesn't have that uh, frame system, uh, it's just not going to be as good of a, of a load hauling pack, no matter who it's from. Mm-hmm. And then obviously there's a, a giant craze for the, the meat shelf deal. So you can also use a meat shelf on there, um, where you can put the meat between the frame and the bag. Yeah. So you said giant craze. So are you not body in all the way on that deal? Fuck, I'm not buying it anyway. I think it's stupid. <laughs> <Dude. Uh-oh. laughs> so, Unless so- it's a day pack. Um, with a day pack, it makes total sense. I mean, hundred percent when you don't have enough room to put anything in the main bag you got to use a shelf but within reason if you have um you know your pack i mean people ask all the time well how do you fit it in there well it's i mean i'm not not reinventing the wheel right there's the middle third of the pack the heaviest weight is going to be the meat well if i packed in with my tent um you know inside the bag on the way in and or, or food well, I just take that out and I put the meat in there and then the, the tent is now strapped to the outside of my bag. And if you're packing gear, uh, depending upon what kind of shelter you have or, or food, a lot of guys will leave their food and hide it for coming back the next year. But, um, you know, it doesn't take 65 pounds, 70 pounds of deboned meat um, plus your gear. Let's say you've got 35 pounds of gear. You're hitting about the max anyone can carry out comfortably anyway for any distance. And so it's really not that big of a deal to get that, that weight in the middle of your back up against your back inside the bag. And we just put it in a dry sack. Mm-hmm. I got you. So you're going to have just compression. Straps. Say, Go ahead. Well, I say, when I say it's stupid, I, it's, <laughs> it's not always stupid. Sometimes it's needed. It's just, if you, we put an animal down and let's say you and uh, I don't know, three of your buddies all have meat shelves and Frank and I put it in the main bag We'll be 25 minutes ahead of you down the trail at a minimum um, because we'll just drop it in the main bag and go where you've got to, with ours and any other system, you've got to open it up like a book, detach it, compress it, make sure everything's in line. It just takes a little bit longer. And, again, we have meat shelves. They work. That's just It's just not something that we, when I say we, Frank or I really have ever, um, it never made sense for us to use with a larger pack. We've used it with day packs, though, but with yeah. a larger bag. Gotcha. So pretty much all the time, you're just going to take your meat, whether it's in game bags or trash bags or whatever, and just put it in your big compartment, strap it up, and go. Yeah. 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 Cool. All right. Well, so are you going to have, like, 
are there compression traps that are running from your frame that just go all the way around the pack, and that's how that meat gets held kind of in the central, central part of that bag? Yeah, exactly. When we design the bags, we obviously design them to hold everything, yeah. uh, you know, in the middle of the bag. So I got you. I got you. And you're just putting the meat in, and you said a dry bag, I guess, and keeping the – because I just – I know a lot of guys, I guess so their deal is they worry about, like, getting blood all over their jackets and stuff inside. Yep. Yeah, we just yeah. put it in a dry sack. Gotcha. I got you. What about as far as, um, like, okay, so where we're going – uh, I've hunted Colorado quite a bit, but, you know, still further south is going to be, you know, central western New Mexico. I mean, I'm, meat care and taking care of that stuff to where it doesn't spoil is kind of going to kind of be a big deal. Um, if we do pack it out on our backs, you know, how many hours can you put a, um, you know, a, a quarter in a pack like that and it be okay without having to let it, you know, stop, pull it out, let it air out, let it cool, if it's that's even an option, you know, like – is there something as far as warm weather when you're packing something out? Do you need to consider that? Yeah, well, there's a lot. There's way more variables to it. But sure. if if you shot it and uh, you know you can get it cooled off, um, and you know let it sit overnight, let it drip, and uh, you get it cool. Um, if you put it in that dry sack, it actually stays cool because the cold is just staying cold inside like a cooler. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you put it in hot, it stays hot. So if if you're deboning it and going straight off the mountain, you just got to haul ass because you didn't let it cool to begin with. So it's a problem no matter what you're doing. You need to get it out and in a cooler as fast as you humanly possible. Yeah. If you're by a creek, an ecothermal corridor, someplace where you can get it cool, the best thing isn't to, to, for as far as the taste of the meat isn't to pack it straight out. It's to let it drip, let it let the blood come out of it, let it cool off. Mm-hmm. and then pack it out after so for us a lot of times we're doing multiple species hunts um, once we get it cooled off and, and the blood drained out everything's cool we put it in that waterproof sack and submerge it in a creek and mm-hmm. then that's like a refrigerator and we'll hunt another five six seven days yeah mm-hmm. well I, i've done or i've seen people do the creek thing where not where they're submerged but at least you know hanging meat over or near a creek and where we're going down there you know, I've been doing my internet research, whatever. You got to take that for what it's worth. But everybody talks about it just being getting so hot during the day, you know. And I'm thinking, well, I mean, yeah, you're still in the mountains, though, and the water's going to be cold, right? So, and there's a decent amount of rivers and streams in the unit we're headed to. I'm just thinking, you know, why could you not go and still use the same stuff that you do in western Colorado, just further south where the wa- the water's still going to be cold? I mean, even though if your day temperatures are up, you know, 80, 85, it's still going to be cool down there on or in that creek, right? Yeah, it should be, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, that, that water's coming from a cold source, so it's definitely going to be, you know, significantly cooler than, than anything else. And there is times, you know, guys will ask me, oh, I shoot it, and it's it's in this conditions, and it's super hot, and it's a no-win situation. It's like, well, get your ass out as fast as you possibly can because yeah. that's the only option you got. And when that's the only option you got – be fit and get it out like yeah. move i mean that's all you got <laughs> yeah the be fit thing so <laughs> that's always kind of humorous uh we do our best to stay fit but just man being a flatlander there's just so much you can do right to be ready for that that mountain stuff or whatever and i i run a good bit and i try to stay in shape but i mean i don't know this is kind of i guess separate from the backcountry stuff we're talking about but you know you do a lot of uh, i wouldn't say I don't know, you're not like a, a fitness guy, but you're fit, and y'all do a lot of cardio training and stuff, it seems. Like, what's if you're talking to a guy like us who are kind of out east and just don't have that elevation or, you know, terrain change to work with, like, what, what can we be doing to prep the best for, you know, a mountain hunt? Yeah, I'd just say just backpack cardio is a big one, you know. Yeah. Climb as many hills as you can with a backpack on, and um, whether it be stadium, bleachers, you know, hills outside, just going up and down, work on the lateral movement as well to, to work on your ankles. So don't just go up and down, also do side hills and then just get used to having a pack on your back. Cause you know, if it's a backpack hunt, it's going to be on there a bunch anyway. So get your hips ready for that and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. So, so kind of speaking of that, we're talking about, uh, being in shape, being, uh, heavy possibly on your back. So like your boots affect, um, a big part of your hunt probably through all this and like i would i'm sure you feel the 
you feel the weight of a heavy pack through your feet uh, eventually. So, what uh, what is what is your boot setup? Is it boots? Is it is it trail runners? How do you usually like to do these things? No, I wear closer to a mountaineering boot um, than anything really. Like I, uh, oh. Uh, I wear a, I wear a stiff boot. Um, even you know, even elk hunting, I wear a stiff boot. Um, I've just my foot cater you know works better with that. So, well, you know, with the stiff boot, um, you know, they are a little bit hotter sometimes. You know, you could probably get away with not as stiff of a boot down there. But fit is key. You know, you want to make sure you have a boot that doesn't leak and fits perfectly and is broken in. Um, some guys are going to like more flexible boots. Some stiffer. It, and that's just totally dependent on, uh, uh, you know, on each person. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a pair of Scarpas that I really like. I mean, they, they're just just comfortable a foot well and everything. But uh, the they're not all leather. The tongue is like a, some type of synthetic. And I noticed uh, last year in Colorado, whenever it would rain, water would, like, catch in there in the laces area and sooner or later it would soak through. Is that – you think – uh, that's like a specifically something wrong with that boot or or some just that way no probably just that boot and the thing is if it's synthetic there if you're walking around let's say in in east texas or whatever you probably poked holes in the membrane yeah and then eventually it just comes through with synthetic you can treat that and it'll actually put a pretty good barrier on it um you know ahead of time it depends on too on which scarpa you know the anytime you get that synthetic tongue you're looking at more problems than if it was, you know, leather. Yeah. So you you want to make sure and treat it with a waterproof type of a treatment. Um, but if it's just a super flexible boot, eventually Gore-Tex inevitably within a year is going to leak one way yeah. or another. Yeah. Generally. Yeah, I got you. Do you run uh, gaiters? Uh, you guys probably won't need to, but I wear them when I need to. Yeah. Yeah. So, so okay. What's, uh, I was kind of figuring that just more for just because I don't want to, that just seems like it would be hot down there. But like, when do you look at a terrain and say, I need gators there? When it's rainy. Rainy. All right. Gotcha. <laughs> it's probably not going to be an issue where we're at down there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You shouldn't be wearing, I mean, some guys wear these little scree gators, which makes sense if you're you know, wearing a lower cut boot where you can get debris in there. But yeah. if it's wet, wear gaiters, and you probably don't want to wear them after that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, a lot of guys, um, myself included, I have like, I have such a narrow foot, man. And, um, and set kind of similar to the backpack situation for us. Like I, I don't really know how to fit a boot for walking up a steep incline, you know, cause we don't have, we don't live in hill country. And so, um, you know, well, I, I think you're probably overcomplicating this. Um, <laughs> you walk upstairs, it'll have the same principle behind it as far as with the boots. If you got a, a narrow foot, I'd say you probably want to put on a La Sportiva. Uh, that's one of the narrower boots on the market. And then when I say La Sportiva, in general, La Sportivas are narrow out of the, I don't know how many offerings they have. Mm-hmm. So you want to, you're not that far away from mountaineering stores. Try to get to a, a store that can try them where you can try them. And they're generally going to have like a little four foot tall, like ramp with yeah. rocks on it. Yep. You know, if you get on there and if you're like just popping your heels, like, like heel drops or calf drops that you would do at the gym, if you're feeling a lot of friction and pressure on that heel, don't buy that boot. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't have to go climb a mountain to, to figure it out it's just i'm more comfortable with it because i know the feel of crappy fitting from climbing a mountain i know it well enough when i go try one on mm-hmm. so if you can go try one on and you feel heel pressure like oh yeah that doesn't seem right don't buy that boot and it's almost like a recurve you put that boot on you're going to probably know that is the boot for you yeah. and all you got to do is calf drops to feel it yeah yeah so it just seems seems to me almost counterintuitive but like you kind of i feel like you want like i mean obviously you want it there's gonna be points of contact on your heel right and so like what is what is good a point point of contact that's good and you know it's not going to slip and rub and everything as opposed to like oh that's a pressure that is just too much and it's going to give me a hot spot uh the one that has a abnormal amount of pressure more than the others yeah um again um, you put on a glove, 
you know, on your hand that, and you're just wearing the glove, it's going to feel comfortable no matter what. Now pretend that there's off, there's leathering on the palm. So you put an ax in your hand and you, and you squeeze the ax like you're going to start to swing it and you can feel pressure where there's sewn in, um, seams mm-hmm. and you can feel that like, let's say between your thumb and your index finger. Mm-hmm. Well, you're probably going to get a blister there once you start swinging. So that's kind of the same principle as if you put it on, there's going to be pressure. But when you're like, ooh, that's like a lot of pressure, I can feel that there. And it's like enough pressure. When I say enough, you won't be able to guess what's going to work its way out breaking in. If it's a lot of pressure, just figure it's probably not going to fit. And as far as the heel goes, if if you're, you know, doing the calf drop and you just feel this uh, abnormal amount of pressure on the top of your heel cup when you're going, you know, to calf dropping, that means your heel's slipping in there a bunch. That's probably not going to fit either. Mm-hmm. Okay. I got you. Yeah, I'm just really bad at stuff like that. I just don't pay attention to, like, uh, uncomfortable parts of the things that are happening to my body. Like, I, I get nicks and stuff like that, and I just don't even notice it sometimes. And I'm really bad at, like, understanding when I'm going to get sick and all these different <laughs> things. So that's not something I'm good at, but... Um, I do know, like I've get a few blisters the size of like silver dollars. You'll be- <laughs> yeah. become good oh, at it. I, I'm just gonna know. stop. Then it's not gonna get that far. I'm just gonna sit there for a while. Yeah. I just man, it just I've had terrible. them, you know, and that's that's kind of why I ask. You know, I was um, I did I videoed a sh- uh, stone sheep hunt two years in a row in 16 and 17, and you know I just I didn't ever get bad. You know, it didn't, but I definitely had hot spots and stuff, and so I just worried. You know, like, well, if I'm walking more than that, is it going to be an issue? So I definitely have have worried about that. And I know, like, guys that they'll just, you know, rub them until they're just bad, you know. And so uh, what does your first aid kit look like? Do you have anything for that kind of uh, issue, or is it more towards uh, major things? You want pre-tape your heels with Luco tape. It's uh, Uh L-E-U-K-O. It'll stay on there for five or seven days. Uh, my med kit is probably the world's worst. I have super glue, Luco tape, some drugs. Uh, yeah, that's probably all I got. Yeah, <laughs> duct tape. Um, I don't really bring anything. Like too much. Is yeah. that uh, is that because of weight, or is it just like you don't want to fool with stuff that you aren't a hundred percent on how to work it? No, no, I'm very capable of. I mean, I can give you even give you a, a tracheotomy if I wanted to. Please don't. Well, that's a scenario. <laughs> What would you bring? Uh, for me, I mean, it's probably going to be pretty minimalist like that just because I'm not a, a first aid kind of guy. I mean, I can I can do a stint. I uh, understand that there's a, a reason to probably tape something up one time if you're bleeding real bad. Um, and besides that, I mean, it's going to be pretty minimal duct tape and ibuprofen. Band-Aids and, yeah, some ibuprofen in case something, you know, something does happen to where you're going to need to at least reduce some swelling and then... Like, I'm not going to bring a clock kit or anything like that. I just don't know what to do with that stuff. So. Well, for what what would you say the number one issue you're going to have down there potentially? Uh, rolled ankles <laughs> for me. Or, well, um, yeah, well, that's that was that's usually two or three on my list. Number one is you're going to – you could have altitude sickness, which means you need drink water and electrolyte mix and drop yeah. down and out. If I've never had that problem, problem before, would, it, would that ever pop up again? I mean, I've you know, I've done plenty of high altitude oh, yeah. stuff. It can, it can pop up at any time. Really? So that, that's, okay. that's an easy fix. Yeah. Um, you know, number two, uh, you could have heat exhaustion or heat stroke. Yeah. All right, well, cool you off and make you stop doing shit and give you fluids. Problem solved. Nothing needed. <laughs> Just common <laughs> sense. You, you cut yourself. Well, I mean, it take stitches for the most part are more for a beautification than anything mm-hmm. to to make it heal better. So super glue and duct tape and keep it clean or luco tape, problem solved. Okay, you cut a finger off. There ain't a whole lot that I'm going to bring that is going to help. Now, if you, <laughs> you can't quick put clock, the finger back on in the in the back country, right? <laughs> yeah, you hit a if you hit an artery. Um, I mean, I'm going to put a tourniquet on you and, and pray to God you don't die. There's not a lot I can help you with. You know, if if you need, oh, let's say if you break an ankle, there's not anything I'm going to put in that kit that I can't just manufacture out of crap I've already got that's going to help you other than give you moral support as you limp your ass out, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe yeah. drugs, right? So I always have painkillers. But um, I'm trying to think, have we 
run into anything where we needed more than that? Yeah, I mean, Havilon knife cuts, you know, glue it and tape it up. Um, yeah, man, I just, I, I, maybe, maybe, if, I don't know, maybe this year I'll have a bad year and I'll carry more. It's just <laughs> super glue, Luco tape, and some drugs seem to fix all problems. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's, uh, I mean, I don't know. There's not a lot of things you can't fix with super glue. I got a buddy who runs a cycle shop and he uses that stuff quite a bit. Hey, he probably <laughs> wouldn't tell you that, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what about, uh, yeah. uh, you know, you were talking about the heat exhaustion and the altitude sickness and water being kind of key in that. Uh, what does your water system look like? Are you carrying uh, a bladder or, or a Nalgene, or how does that work for you? I have a, a Nalgene on my belt, and then uh, I have a, a bladder, not with a hose in it, just a big bladder in my pack. And so I know if, if water's pretty sparse, I'll have filled up the bladder and then just transfer it into my Nalgene as I need to. Um, you know, in the back country and then electrolyte mix, you know, it's not just water, water by itself is good, but if you're sweating out, you know, obviously salt and wait, anyway, your electrolytes, yeah. you need to replenish those. So while you're drinking water, you need to have some kind of electrolyte mix mixed in there. Yeah. Is that, are you, uh, filtering all of that into your bladder at the time? Or are you filtering from bladder to Nalgene or what are you doing there? Uh, we use a Steripen, so... Um, if I'm filling up the Nalgene as I'm hiking on throughout the day, we use the SteriPen to clean that. Yep. And then in the bladder, I fill that up and I just, uh, I use Aqua Mira Drops, um, MSR, like Aqua Tabs. Mm-hmm. And I throw those in there, shake it around. And, and uh, then when I'm pouring it into my, my Nalgene, the water I had in the bladder is already purified. As I'm filling up the Nalgene in creeks, I just use a SteriPen. And Frank, Frank pretty much does the same thing. Yeah, yeah. I've got a SteriPen and have used it quite a bit. But uh, do you mess with carrying that little filter thing that they give you with it, or do you just roll straight, just no, fill the bottle? I just fill the bottle. Yeah, I got you. Well, I, uh, I just, <laughs> I don't know how many little squirmies I want in there with it. It's like kind of always <laughs> where it's like I don't know. There's plenty of good clean clear creeks but i can just imagine especially if you go hunt in an arid environment you know what do you do like if you like are having to fill up out of a wallow and stuff like that you just deal with it yeah and they they only it's not like the pump makes it not taste like elk piss yeah it still tastes horrible <laughs> there is a one i used last year that had uh like a, a carbon deal in there um that that did help it taste better but that filter plugged up pretty damn quick anyway. So yeah. it, 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 we, I mean, if we do a wallow, we'll use drops and we'll use the stirrup pin, but it still tastes like, shit. but I mean, it, the chance of having to go through a wallow or slim. Um, but when you do, I mean, it's just part of life and yeah. you kind of just deal with it. Yeah. It's kind of more just like something you have to do and you try to not put yourself in that situation, I guess. I mean, how much you guys are from Texas, right? Yeah. Have you watched true grit? A few times, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, remember when he says, uh, I've lapped water from a hoof print and been happy to have it? Yeah. That's not you guys, huh? <laughs> no, no, I haven't haven't had to do but that you... yet. Try to try to keep a little bit of water around, you know. But, I mean, I don't know. That's kind of part of this thing is uh, being mentally prepared to deal with backcountry scenarios. That's just something I haven't had to do, and I'm trying to make sure that – you know, all the training in the world is all good and shooting your bow is great, but if you just can't hack it, then uh, it doesn't do you much good to go back there if you got to turn around. So I'm just trying to make sure that I'm prepared to do all that kind of stuff, you know? Oh, yeah. No, I get it totally. I mean, it's it's different. I just did a podcast with um, Barklow. He's a guy at, at Sitka, and yeah. he, he and I were talking about um, kind of – you know, you get into a guy like he or I or, or Frank or, or some of these other guys that are desensitized. Yeah. Um, you know, Frank will be, you know, squishing mosquitoes and eating them while you're crying <laughs> of what seems like super simple and fun to us is like crisis level for you because we've done it for so long. Yeah. Um, I don't, I can't, I'm trying to think. Frank almost died of, when was that, three years ago? <laughs> Two years ago, Frank got pulmonary edema. Oh, cool! Um, <laughs> Gosh. And uh, and he, you know, and he he came out, and then you know, last year I had cut my hand uh, <clears throat> badly, glued it back together, and had some other fungus growing on him. Um, mm. Frank, you didn't have any problems. 
No, Frank was a hunter. He Frank was an ace last year, no issues. He was babying me. So, <laughs> you know, but part of it's just staying back there. And, I mean, that's easy to say, but some of it's just mentally kind of having the wherewithal or the fortitude, I guess, not wherewithal, but the fortitude to just hack it out. Yeah. Because um, you're going to be uncomfortable, and there's only so much crap you can bring because, you know, bring too much crap, you won't even get there. So, you know, a lot of it's just mentally kind of sucking it up, learning along the way so you and your next trip isn't quite so bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. And I, I don't know, for me, like, the issue on this that you're talking about is, like – it's it's kind of hard to say, and I'm not really directing this to you, Tyler, but, like, just the other person, right? Because you can do so much that you can do for yourself, but, like, making sure that the other person has done all these things to prepare for mental fortitude or whatever it might be and that they, they're ready to go, too, is, like, just the part that you can't really guarantee, you know? So, like... You can just not hunt with them. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's my suggestion. Well, when you're uh, when you're learning how to do the backcountry thing, I guess you're just going to have to go through some uh, some folks until you find the right one. So, Tyler, be up to snuff. All yeah, right? no, I, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll steer, I mean, joking aside, like it is difficult to find. Um, and, I mean, I bring Frank up obviously because one, he's sitting beside me, but two, we have the same moral compass. We have about the same physical ability. We have a, I'd say Frank's probably a little more uncanny than me when it comes to living solo. I don't know that Frank would ever come back unless he had to. <laughs> well, he's got a hot girlfriend now. So he might come back, but oh, Frank things can have changed. stay pretty much. Yeah, I mean, Frank can pretty much stay forever, right, yeah. solo. And yeah. I can when I have to, but um, I don't. he probably enjoys it a bit more than me. Where after maybe 12, 14 days, I'm kind of pushing like, yeah, I should probably come off the mountain. And I could stay longer. But there's a difference between being mentally able to stay and wanting to stay Mm -hmm. where you guys solo might only make it three days and you're just freaked, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you guys. Yeah, no, you were guys doing it. Yeah. Um, And then you might make it, might get back there. And generally what's going to happen is you're going to, you're going to either come back early or barely make it to the end, more of a mental grinder to say you did it. And you're going to be like, my God, that was horrible. The moment you're driving home and you stop at McDonald's, you're like, I, wish, I can't wait to go again. <laughs> well, four hours earlier, you couldn't do anything but to, to get off the mountain. And then eventually those kind of cross to where you don't run that issue anymore. You don't, you don't have it to mm-hmm. where, you know, it, it takes a lot for me to, to come up other than boredom, you know, if we're on a backpacking trip and it's scouting and I'm bored, I'm like, Hey, let's go back and watch a movie. But when we're hunting, it takes a lot for me to, to come back. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I I kind of agree. And, you know, I haven't done the backcountry thing, but uh, if you hunt a lot, you're going to find some some scenario where you have to grind it out and you have to just deal with things. And for me, you know, we hunt a lot of whitetails, right? And, you know, on day six where you got up at four and went to bed at 11 for five days straight and it's still 30 degrees outside and the wind is blowing, like it stinks, you know, and, and I, I hope that that kind of thing translates over and I feel like it will as long as, uh, you know, or we kind of tell ourselves that, hey, you know, we've done hard things before and it's not going to be the end of the world here. And I don't know, earlier you were talking about um, how like you're going to end up bringing way too much crap that you don't need and this and that. And I feel like that's a place where I'm at on sleep systems trying to figure out really what is the right way. You know, there's these ultra minimalist guys who are just running a tarp and just laying on the ground. And then you got guys who we've talked to who are just, you know, just big old burly guys who bring in a full size tent and they just deal with it the whole time. And, you know, y'all, y'all do make some sleep system stuff, but, um, you know, for like a more arid or warmer season hunt, uh, what do you think is really necessary for a guy to have in the backcountry? very little um in the case of where you're at just because i'm familiar with that area um i mean i'd probably be rolling in with just a tarp and a piece of tyvek because it's hard in hell anyway um bugs shouldn't be a problem so um you know i'd I'd probably just run a tarp and a piece of tyvek and you know if you're worried about that just get a a real lightweight three season tent yeah yeah well that's that's good to know so I kind of thought the tarp thing, and I don't know. Uh, I mean, what's the point in having the thing over your head unless it dews or rains at night, right? I mean, does it do down there dur- during the night too much? It, that won't. It's not going to help that anyway. Um, the uh, 
Well, wind, it's also a sunblock. So, yeah. in the course of the day, every hide under it in shade, right? Yeah. Um, helps for that. But, yeah, just squalls coming through is mm-hmm. a big thing, you know, and you will get that. Um, just to keep your crap dry and then sunshade if you're back at camp and laying under it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think it's just the whole fear of the unknown kind of thing or whatever, you know, like I, I'm not. I'm not tied to a tent by any means, but I just kind of wondered about, you know, I'm glad you said bugs aren't that big of a deal uh, just because, I don't know, you're in the desert southwest, you're just thinking about scorpions and all kinds of little creepy crawlies at night, you know, and, uh, but, I don't know, I guess if you're on a sleeping pad, then it's not that big of a deal. You can just, uh, you're up off the ground a little bit and a tarp would be fine. Yeah, where you're at will be. I mean, yeah. there's, there's spots in New Mexico and Arizona that, you know, there's spiders, like scorpions and, and, uh, uh, well, scorpions mostly, but snakes, and they can be an issue where you might want to pack a, you know, a tent or a bug net at the very least, and do like mm-hmm. a bug net bivy and a tarp, or just depends on how light you want to go. If you don't mind carrying a little extra weight, then a three season tent's not a horrible option. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that if there's a place you're trying to cut some weight, is that the place that you'd look to first? Is sleep systems? Where you're going, yeah. If yeah. it was a, a, a different area, it certainly would not be my shelter. But where you're at, then it's, that's probably one of the easier ones. And it's more of just an assessment of what's going on. So, you know, for example, if Frank and I are, are heading in, I don't know, 10 miles with these crazy elevation gains and, and, and losses, and we're just going to suck and wind getting in there from that, um, but there's a lot of water source. We may drop down to just aqua tabs. We may just carry an algae all day. Um, you know, if it's going to be, uh, you know, weather dependent, whatever, we can skip on some of our clothing. We, we might, um, either lighten up each layering, uh, piece of like of our layering system. Each one might be a lightweight, whether it be the fleece or the base layer, the rain gear, or whatever, we'll lighten that up. Um, those are the things we kind of look at, uh, you know, depending on where you're going is relatively easy. So it's not going to be uh, any crisis going on or shouldn't be. I'm glad you said that because honestly, man, uh, I've kind of figured it's not going to be terrible. Um, and then it, you just get on forums or whatever and people are like, oh man, that country's rough. And it's like, man, really? Like it, cause it's going to top out at like 9,500, you know, like, come on. So they had, I mean, one man's rust, another man's joke. So keep yeah. that in mind when you're reading those. But the country back there can be rougher, yeah. but that doesn't mean that that's going to affect your gear. Yeah. I mean, at the very least, you might just go a little bit lighter weight. When I'm talking, I mean, terrain is the last thing I'm worried about for the most part. You know, if it's steep here and there, you can get around that, you know, just go a little slower. You'll be fine. It's It's when you're dealing with, you know, from the ground up, snakes, scorpions, spiders, all the way to the, you know, up in the clouds, snow, rain, wind, lightning. Um, you know, you you can't control the terrain other than pack a little bit lighter, but you can prep for all those other things. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Cool. Well, so we don't want to take up too much more of your time, man. It's been great. You are just a wealth of knowledge as always. Uh, but I do feel like something we haven't really touched much on, and I think that you're really good at is, is kind of like the um, – the woodsmanship side of things do you have a couple things maybe that like you could would just tell somebody who's trying to maybe go out in the backcountry for the first couple times like things that they need to know that's not really gear stuff but just like how to do stuff what would be some things that you try to tell people learn to read a map um above and beyond the gps you know learn terrain association topography learn uh animal behavior where the animals are going to I can look at a map and figure out where the animals are before I get there, Mm -hmm. learn that. Um, You know, elk need to eat, sleep, drink, and have sex in September. Figure out where they're doing those things. You're probably going to kill one. Um, You know, reading the weather is another one, but really reading the map would be the first one. Um, You know, obviously, there's some common sense involved um, with everything, but having common sense in your layering system, your sleep system, um, the other thing too, which you talked about, um, how many days are you guys going in? Uh, well, we're kind of, kind of trying to decide how we're going to do this hunt everything's on the table, right? But the original idea was to go in way back there for the whole nine days of the season and actually get there a day early, you know, that kind of thing. 
but uh, I don't know. I'm kind of leaning more towards making like a four day loop kind of thing and coming back to the truck, replenishing and going back out. And I'd be interested to know what you think about those or if there's another scenario you think might work better. Well, since you don't know you could make it, I wouldn't plan on the whole 10 day thing. That'll really screw your plans up if you hike all the way in there and you're sucking nine titty and three. Yeah. So I would do the four and four, five and four thing, you know four nights, five days, Yeah. Uh, make a loop come back. If you got to run into town to get a burger and replenish great or whatever. Um, but then you're not packing as much weight. You're more effective on your feet. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're not going to be that far. Even if you were 10 miles in, well, 10 miles is pushing it. If you were five miles in, uh, you know, you can do five miles at, you know, slow pace in two hours, you know, mm-hmm. probably closer to you know an hour and a half. Um, you know, not that long. You're not wasting that much time if you're fit enough. So you can come out and come back in pretty quickly, not burn that much time to, you know, to grab more food. So I, I would suggest two smaller trips rather than one big one. If you had done it a lot, yeah. one, you wouldn't be asking me the question, but two, <laughs> I'd be safer to, you, well, you know what I mean? You'd, you'd know what you're comfortable with. I didn't yeah, mean that sure. in a negative no, way, no, but no, if you've done it a lot. That's the whole reason we had you on, you know, like, the, like we're trying to learn this stuff for sure. I don't. I would say, I, I I keep asking Frank, but so you get more than my opinion. How many emails do we get of guys? I was a high school or a college football player. I'm in great shape, dude. I'm ready to do whatever it takes. I mean, I'm talking. They write a book on how prep they are. Yeah. And just just totally puss out the first three, and come out and they're like, and they have every excuse in the world. You know what I mean? I I sprain my toe or my pink. I don't know. Make something up. When in reality, they just didn't want to be back there. And there is nothing wrong with that. There's, it's not meant for everybody. Mm-hmm. But you do not want to base your entire plan off of the unknown of can you make it back there. Some guys aren't – I can't spell, right? I'm not going to go enter a spelling bee. I know that because I can't spell. So you don't know if you can backpack hunt long-term, long-distance, um, or are going to enjoy it. And part of it is enjoy, having enjoyment when you're back there. Mm-hmm. So – gambling everything on going in 10 miles is a big gamble where, you know, two, five days or two, four nighters, whatever, not as big of a gamble. And the chance of you having more fun or, or a definite compared to a maybe. This is a little bit different, but kind of along the same train of thought uh, on a hunt like this, would it be more advantageous to go back, set up a base camp, you know, five, six, seven miles back, whatever you, you feel like you can make it and do and just hunt on like a radius out from camp every day and come back to that same camp? Or would you put camp on your back every day and just go where the elk take you? Oh, that's what you said. The elk take you. Yes. Yeah. Hell no. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. No, no, don't do that. I mean, that's like the most ineffective Which one? way Which one? to, to go to have everything on your back and go where the elk take you. Yeah. If you're going where the elk take you, that means they're going where you scared them to anyway. So <laughs> more than most likely, <laughs> like if, if we're hunting with our camp on our backs, then something has gone terribly wrong in the game plan, right? Like gen- now you're going to have to move with your pack on and you might as well be hunting while you do it. Yeah. But generally you want to go in and hunt two, three, four, five days in one area and, and, and hunt around it. And then by then you've probably blown them out and then move again mm-hmm. or, or two a days and then move again in two days. But, you know, if you're careful and you're not getting winded, you know, you can hunt pretty effectively from, you know, say base camp that, that sounds like you're living in the lap of luxury. You're coming back to your one man shelter, right. And probably, you know, your sleep system and a little bag hanging in the tree. There's not a lot coming back to, yeah, sure. but you're, you know, your 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 basically uh, area of of operation, you know, is going to be by water. Hopefully, not by the elk to scare them off. Where you're you're coming back to that spot and hunting, you know, a mile or two around that spot. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Cool. Well, uh, what's interesting about this whole thing we're doing is that everyone has a different take on that. And for my first thought was to do what you're talking about, and then I've had some guys tell me to do the just you know chase them all night until it gets dark and throw up a tent every night and i don't know part of it sounds good but just part of it sounds inefficient because you're going to waste time every morning and every evening when you could be hunting or at least sleeping where you're setting up camp and trying to find a new place to put a you know put your sleeping pad or whatever when if you go ahead 
it's just it's not just that you are so ineffective hunting with 45 pounds on your back yeah especially if you're trying to climb you guys will look at each other and just say shoot me i'm done <laughs> like it sucks hunting with 45 pounds on your back it just it does and i don't know that i mean i don't think you've ever done that have you backpack hunting hunt with the, your wall of everything on your back every day I think that got blown out of proportion with Cam back in the day and uh, not taken away from anything that Cam, if he was doing that, more power to him. Yeah. But if you're having to do that, you are scaring the <laughs> out of animals so bad, you're forced to hunt with what's on your back. And, and I make light of this, I make jokes about it, but truly, if you have a 45-pound load and you're trying to sneak in on an elk, you might, I mean... It just ain't happening, you know. Yeah. You're gonna have to drop it, go back and get it, and so yet yeah, don't don't do that. It won't it won't pan out. Now, when you're moving from A to B, you know, obviously you want to be cognizant of your surroundings and hunt your way to B. Mm-hmm. But after you hit B, drop all that crap and go to a day pack. Yeah, yeah, I got you. So um, you mentioned weight while ago, and I know we're kind of wrapping up, but I, I really it's kind of the broad subject here. But like. I mean, what's what's feasible on say you like you're going to do the five day thing? Like, what are you looking at hauling in on oh, your you, back? You should, you know, on average, you know, some guys are going to be less or more, but on yeah. average, forty pounds. You know, you probably get her down to thirty five yeah. pretty easily for for four or five days. Depends on how much you eat, what shelter you've got. But if you're over forty, you really need to start assessing what the hell you're putting in that pack. Nah, um, it's we're we're thirty, man. Well we're good under. to go. We're fine. You know, we're young. No big deal. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> But no, and honestly, okay, here's something that you talked about a while ago a little bit, like with the whole, like, you know, I was a a high school athlete, blah, blah, blah. Like, Tyler and I, both our mindset is like, man, I'll tough out a few extra pounds if it helps me be comfortable. Is that an okay mindset to have? It depends on what it is. I'm totally of that mindset. Yeah. But it depends on what it is, if, if if it makes sense, meaning, Oh, oh! I don't want to have a tarp. I want to have a shelter. That yeah. makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to eat a little bit more food. That makes sense. Oh, I want to change my pants three times. That does not make sense. <laughs> yeah. You know. Oh, I want a little bit more comfortable pack. Um, you know, and in out of the options, you know, this is the one we get. You know, hey, your competitors packs four ounces lighter. <laughs> that doesn't really make sense. You know, if the other pack are comfortable. <laughs> what the do? Um, yeah. So you get, but. If you're or, or or your stove, you know, like oh, I want to be safe and bring two canisters. Well, one guy can take one, one can be the other to make sure you can make coffee and, and food every night. Mm-hmm. But you know, bringing in a, a stove that weighs two pounds that doesn't make sense. So if it makes sense, yeah, I mean, carry an extra. Like if you worry about sleep, carry a thicker sleeping pad if you sleep on that better. Carry yeah. a bigger one because sleep is vital. Yeah, yeah, no kidding, man. Cool. Well, Aaron, thanks so much for all the knowledge, dude. Uh, I can't tell you how much it's helped, and it's. I really appreciate uh, the uh, frank way you put things. No pun intended there with your, with your compadre. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, if people want to frank. learn, <laughs> do what? <laughs> no, I yelled at Frank. I went Frank. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if people want to learn more about Kafaru, uh, where would we need to send them? Oh, you can check it out. Uh, Kafaru.net is the website, K-I-F-A-R-U. Uh, Instagram's uh, Kafaru underscore I-N-T-L. Um, and then if you – Frank is Frank Peralta. If you want to check it, Frank out, um, I'm Aaron Snyder, uh, 1A. And uh, we have Kafaru Cast, which is our own podcast, which is uh, K-I-F-A-R-U-C-A-S-T. Um you yeah, can I mean, spell. Those... You said you couldn't spell while ago. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> no, I said I wouldn't enter a spelling B. I oh, can spell okay. four letter. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Do we find Frank's profile on Tinder or where do we where do we find Frank at? <laughs> Frank's not. He's off all that. He's a. He's been saved. Oh, all right, man. Frank is. Frank is a uh, new man. So that's good. So, <laughs> anyways, cool, dude. We'll uh, link all that stuff in the show notes down below. Uh, go check out uh, Kafaro for some legit packs, shelters, and I mean, what else are y'all guys offer nowadays? You got some apparel stuff too, or something, right? Uh, we've yeah, we've had the jackets forever, but uh, you know, synthetic jackets, pants, sleeping bags, survival blankets multitude of pockets teepees uh pockets. tarps so um well like pullouts you know we have different uh ex- like uh ditty bags basically yeah. we have a bunch of those 
game bags, all kinds of stuff. I just laugh because Tyler's a pockety guy. He he does not like the idea of minimalist packs. He likes the <laughs> the you know little things to shove I, things and lose them all the time. I guarantee, go with Frank and I on two to three trips. You will never have a multitude of pockets again because you're like, why am I carrying all this? This makes no sense. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm just semi organized, man. I like to have I like the thought of having two or three pockets or pouches to have, you know, like my my fire starter or whatever it might be, and you know. Oh, that makes that makes total sense. We yeah. do that. We have these little pullouts, and we'll have our. Uh, you know, basically, I'll have a med kit, and anyway, we do the same kind of thing yeah. as far as that goes. Yeah, we do get some guys that like want a pocket for their toothbrush or want a pocket <laughs> for everything. I'm like, dude, God, it's a lot of pockets, man. Mm, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That makes up for a lot of weight. So I don't know. For me, I just lose things if I shove things in too many holes. So I need a lot of, lot less area for that. But. Anyways, dude, That's thanks so much. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Walked right into that one. Oh, I know. As soon as I said it, I was like, hey, this is not going to go well. <laughs> uh, anyways, dude, thanks so much for the time today, Aaron. Really appreciate it, man. And yeah. uh, can't wait to see how y'all season goes this year. Y'all are uh, always getting out there and uh, not only pushing it hard, but actually killing things. And that makes for some really entertaining uh I don't know, just uh, observance from afar, I guess you'd say. So, thanks, man. Yeah, well, good luck to you guys. Keep us posted. Um, try not to carry too much crap or die of hypothermia, and hopefully you don't need a big med kit because I'm going to feel horrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, compound fracture. Well, Snyder said we don't need anything, so I'll just walk out on this bone. It'll be fine. So. <laughs> Anyways. <Okay. laughs> thanks, All dude. All right, well, you guys take it easy. All right, yeah, I'll see you. It. See you. Man, that was some killer info. If you found this interview helpful, be sure and leave us a review below and comment what you thought was the most helpful tip from this episode. For sure. Make sure you also follow us on our social media platforms, Facebook and Instagram, and also subscribe on YouTube so you can see how these hunts turn out. Remember, this is your element. Live in it. <laughs> Been waiting my whole life for that.